So Professor Beffler, in addition to being a science fellow, is also a dean for the Natural and Visible Natural Sciences at Wisconsin. And today she's going to give us a talk about uh, discrete geometry polygons and polygon equations. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. This is very nice. Uh, uh, I want to start by saying that I would like to um, to give this talk in memory of your colleague Agnes um, Santos. I I actually I met her maybe a couple of times. I, I was not close to her, but I have friends uh, this month, Phil and uh, Hubert, Hubert, who are very close to her, and they are very devastated. And now this has been a tragedy. So I would like to dedicate um, this to her and hope that the family is finding some comfort. Um, all right, so I want to talk about discrete geometry of polygons and solitons equation, and this is something that I, um, as you said, I'm a dean, and that's, that's a big nightmare. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so this is what keeps me sane, so to speak, and, and unfortunately, I don't do it as much as I would like to do, but um, I'm going to start with examples. I'm going to spend some time actually with examples rather than give you a lot of definitions because that will give you a sense of, of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, etc. cetera. So um, as you might have a bunch of curves, so this is a flow of curves, right? Something that looks like this. They are evolving with time. And this is an Euclidean R3. Uh, so this equation is called the vortex filament equation is ut equals kb b is the binormal so for those who are not very familiar with Euclidean geometry when you have a curve you have the tangent right vector you have the normal vector which is telling you which direction the curve is curving and then the binormal is perpendicular to those two uh, the other two, uh, PA, what is called the osculating plane the binormal pulls you out of the osculating plane so this flow what it does is takes the curve away from where it curves and from the osculating plane. And it goes faster when the curvature is smaller, it's, it's larger, that means, say, you know, a small ring uh, goes very fast. And when it gets bigger and the curvature is smaller, then it goes smaller, right? That's what the filament flow does. So this equation is invariant under the Euclidean group. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that if I have a solution here, right? And I transform the solution by the Euclidean group, say so you rotate it or translate it, then the curve, of course, this flow will transform by that Euclidean group, will rotate, say, but so will the binormal, right? And the curvature would remain the same. So that means that if I had a solution here and I transform it by the Euclidean group, then it is a solution also, it remains. So this is what is called the equation is invariant under the Euclidean group. The Euclidean group is going to take solutions to solutions. Um, all right. So when that happens, when I have that invariant, I should be able to write this equation in terms of what we call the invariance of the Euclidean group for the flow. And that's the curvature and the torsion, right? We all know that uh, this is parameterized by R, so it's all fine. So the curvature and the torsion are going to determine this flow. So I should write an equation for the curvature and the torsion that is induced by this flow, right? And we want to look at that. And indeed, if, if I take the polar decomposition of the curvature and the integral of the torsion, not the torsion itself, I write an equation for that. And again, this equation, which is very well known to be the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, okay? And this is a transformation between the vortex filament of the nonlinear Schrodinger, there is one known, it's due to Haas model, very classic. All right. So, in my world, what I say is that the vortex filament flow is an Euclidean realization of the nonlinear Schrodinger, right? They're essentially the same, it just I added a group to it. <laughs> I added the Euclidean group to it. Uh, if you want to go from the vortex filament to the nonlinear Schrodinger, I got rid of the group. Um, otherwise, I have it if I got it. All right. So, this uh, nonlinear Schrodinger and many of the other equations I want to talk about are called soliton equations, completely integrable. They all have all of these names. They have solutions that are very peculiar. For example, 
uh, solitons. That's what the name comes from. Right? These are solitary waves. Um, I have so Madison has in downtown has a little um, uh, statue of a budget, and and it has a, a very narrow and thin water flow going. I used to take my kids there and tell them, put your hand in and push to make waves, right? And then they would do that, there would be one wave. <laughs> and say, you see, you see waves, they said, there's only one. And they would get all upset because they were used in, in the beach to see many, right? And then I would tell them, okay, fight against each other. I would put one in each side and say, just clash your waves. And then they would go, well, I'm gonna clash your other. They would just cross and do nothing. So there are these wonderful properties of waves of solitons, which is that they exist for a long time, right? They are extremely stable. They, you know, they pass each other. They don't really bother each other. They're beautiful. So there is a question of what about the, the realization? So they have interesting uh, solutions to, or is there something cool? So I'm going to show you some solutions of that equation. The first one is a vortex um, made out of bubbles. And these are vortices that, that dolphins make. Let me just show you if I can. There's music. Out of it. So the dolphins make this with the air hole. It's going to make one right here. And you can see, so this is a solution of the vortex film. <laughs> it, moves, it moves away from the, from the oscillating plane. Extremely stable, and you can see how stable it is. It's clearly more and more those, right? And, uh, and they do it for fun, by the way. There is no practical purpose. <laughs> it's going to eat it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really stable. This one is going to jump it really hard. Look, it wants to rotate it, it's trying to rotate it, and it destroys it. But anyway, so there are interesting properties that these solutions to the vortex filament flow have. I'm going to show you another movie, and this movie is again two vortex filaments, the same type. They are made out of smoke, not of bubbles. And what they're going to do is they're going to clash two of them. They're going to do like my kids, uh, right? They're going to throw two of them identical sizes, one is blue, one is red, against each other. Just think about what they're going to do. And I'm going to show you what they're going to do. And then you say, oh, that's what I thought. Or not. Or I, I assure you, they're not going to cross each other. <laughs> OK. So how do I go for the next? Yeah, there it is. All right. There we go. All right, that's what they do. So, so again, these are the cool properties that I have. By the way, um, actually recreating that theoretically is an open problem in case you wanna work on it. What happens there and why does that? I mean, physically, it sort of makes sense to the physicist, but actually creating a model that where you can see that happening. That's not known. Um, okay, so lots of uh, interesting stuff in solid solutions. This is for fun. I'm not gonna, I actually don't know a lot about this, this uh, phenomenon. But um, I wanna talk to you about discrete systems. So I'm gonna talk about discretizations of these equations, right? And how I'm gonna use geometry to discretize them and to find things about them. So when you discretize, you can discretize in two ways, right? You can discretize both in time and space and you create a map of polygons. Right? So here, you discretize this curve. Suddenly you have polygons, right? And then you can say, well, I'm gonna discretize time and instead of a continuous flow, I just have a map that takes this polygon to the next polygon to the next polygon and I'm discretizing also the time, that's a map. Or I can discretize just the space. If I discretize all the space, then I have a polygon, but then the polygon is gonna change smoothly, right? 
someone is unmute in the call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. We mute you. <laughs> so I get this guy is only the curve, but then I have a polygon, and then the polygon is going to move smoothly. Okay. So there are two ways. I'm going to talk mostly about number two, but I'm going to show you an example in number one first. And then I'll show you an example in number two. And then I'll tell you what we worked about in number two. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So the, I, I have to say the connection between geometry of lattices and discrete intervals is well established. And Goben, Consuelo, and Hoffman, and many more have done. And I just found out one of your new faculty <laughs> have done a lot of work uh, around that. So this is not new. OK, so the first example is a sample of double discretization is the pentagram map. So this is a map on the projective plane. So the projective plane, what I mean is um, lines that go through the origin in R3, right? Which is the space of lines in R3. So what is the pentagram map? The pentagram map is very simple. You have a pentagon, and then you're going to join every other vertex with a line. And those lines are going to intersect and create another pentagon. So you have the pentagon mark will take the black pentagon to the red pentagon. Yeah, that's pretty easy, right? So this, what you see there is, I'm going to show you here, one, two, three, four, five, say that I have five lines, right? So what you see there is this image. So that's what I'm showing you there. When I say that there is a line joining two vertices, what I mean is that there is a plane right, that contains the two lines that determine the vertex, and that plane into one cardio. You understand? So I want, because I'm in projected geometry now, the previous geometry. So I'm here. So then you say, all right, so this map tends to be invariant at the projected group. That's in fact, all these constructions in which you use planes to, to find intersections are all projected with variants. So those are good choices. So you, in principle, should be able to write this again in terms of curvatures and torsions, right? In terms of invariance of this polygon. So the question is, what are the invariants of the polygon? Okay. So you see here, every vertex of the polygon has four lines coming out of it, right? They go to all the other vertices, yeah, the two sides. So four lines out of there. If you have four lines on the plane and you cut here, right? There is an invariant that corresponds to these four lines, which is the cross ratio of those four points. And if you don't know what the cross ratio is, I have a hard time remembering what it is, by the way. So if you're like the so it's AC divided by BC divided by AD divided by BD. That's the only way I can remember what this. Um, so it's this number, right? This is independent from the line that it choose to cross. It's always the same number. So it's an invariant of these four lines. All right. So each vertex of the, my pentagon has four lines, each vertex has a cross ratio. So there's a theorem that says that is what determines the pentagon. So if two pentagons have the same cross ratio for each vertex, they are essentially the same pentagon up to a projective transformation. So those are my curvatures and torsions, so to speak, right? those cross ratios. All right. So let me show you a cross ratio of the red. This is the cross ratio of this vertex and the red pendant, right? You see those four lines. There is a vertex in the black one with exactly the same cross ratio. Can we tell?
hint is above. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the one, that's the line that crosses it. It crosses in the exact same point, so they have the same cross ratio. So the cross ratio of this vertex is the same one as the one as above. And you can do that in every vertex. So you got, when you write the pentagram map in terms of the invariance of those polygons, of those pentagons, they are, is the identity. So that's simple. You can do the same thing for hexagons, and it's a little more complicated. And then you write it in terms of invariance of hexagons, and then you come to the conclusion that is not the identity, but if you do it again, it is the identity. So written in terms of invariance, the one for the black and the one for the blue is the same. All right, so then you get all excited and you say, all right, so given any number of signs, do I get a number of iterations I have to do so that I get the identity? And the answer is no. Um, because this map doesn't have all closed orbits, is an integrable map. That means that sometimes you'll have closed orbits, but sometimes what you will have is something that is dense in a certain colors, right? So this was proved by, um, so for the moderate space, the map of the pentagon is the identity and hexagon is an involution. And in general, is a completely integral map. And this was proved by Yevsienko and Schwartz and Tabakov and Solovyev in 2011. So this pentagram map was actually um, defined by Richard Schwartz in 92, and he was a graduate student or almost a graduate student. And a professor told him, you're wasting your time. That's really, you don't get any good math out of that. Um, he proved him wrong, I guess. Uh, perhaps more interesting of what it really uh, hooked me to this is that if you take the continuous limit of the pentagram map as defined on the invariant, not the pentagram map in general, but as defined on the invariant, you take the continuous limit and what you get is the Boussinesque equation. Again, another solid equation um, and completely integrable PDE. So as you see, there are three levels here, right? You have Boussinesque, you have the discretization, which is the pentagram up on the invariance, which can be the identity or the information, et cetera. And then you have the pentagram, which to me, they go like this. <laughs> Here is the PD on the invariant on the on the polygons. Okay, I'm gonna now talk. This is my last example of polygonal evolution. So what I have is polygons that are gonna move with time. Okay, I'm gonna talk about twisted polygon in projective space. So what is a twisted polygon? It's, it's like a helix, right? So if you think of a helix, you, know, you have a period, and then after a period, you have translated right, your point, and then you're going to copy this. Just make copies of this with the translation. You're going to translate this and translate, etc. This translation is called the monodromy. Okay, so a twisted polygon is exactly that. You have a polygon, and then after a certain number of vertices, you're gonna have a transformation from the group, whatever group you have, in this case, projective group, and then you're gonna have a copy of this up to that transformation. And then you're gonna just repeat and repeat and repeat. So that's what that says. N is the period, big N, capital N, and the element G is the monodromy. And after N, you get the monodromy plane. So essentially you have a finite polygon, it's just that you're repeating copies and pasting them with the monotony. Right? Okay. So now I have a polygon in RP1. So RP1 is the plane, right? And I have here a polygon, that means I have a bunch of lines going through it, through the origin as you know, four vertices of my polygon. 
and I have the projected group. And I'm gonna take a lift. What does it mean a lift to R2? It's just a representative in the line, right? So I'm gonna choose that representative. It's sort of a peculiar way. So if this is gamma n, gamma n plus one is gonna be choice ch chosen. So this A is one. And you say, well, totally random. As I was talking to him before, this connects it to central fine geometry, but I'm not gonna talk about that. So there is a reason for to do that. But you might think, can you do this, right? Because this is not a, a, a random polygon. This is gonna go and eventually there's gonna be a monodromy, right? And the monodromy is gonna be somewhere and it's gonna be a repetition of this, but there is a, a, jump, you know, a step there in the middle in which you are connecting the monodromy with the other. So can you actually do that choice? And the answer is yes, if N is not even. If N is even, you can't. But if N is not even, then you can't do that. And you just choose that and you have that lift. So now I have a polygon with a lift, okay? All right, so in this polygon, so now I'm gonna forget about this and what I have is, you know, something like this. So, okay, now in the, I'm in the projected plane. Um, what are the invariants? This is projected plane. So this is simpler because it's just the cross ratio of four consecutive ones, right? So I'm gonna take the invariant for this line would be the cross ratio of the next four. And of course you could take two before and then you know, it doesn't matter. And then um, for this one would be the cross ratio of the two coming left, right? And so on. those are your invariants, those are QN. Those are not the same, the only invariants, by the way. If I take the area created by this and this one, not two consecutive ones, but you know, every other one, that's another invariant. You can choose different ones. You can write one in terms of the other, by the way. Okay. And now I'm going to define the projected tangential flow. So, what is this? So, say that I have here gamma n, right? I'm going to take this vector, which is gamma n minus one to n plus one, okay? And that's going to be my direction. I'm going to move in that direction. And I'm going to do the same thing in the next. In here, I will take this vector, and that will be the direction that I move. So I'm if you think about it, this part here is a discrete vector field, correct? Because I'm just saying to each vertex, I'm associating a vector. So that's the discrete vector field. And why am I dividing by this determinant? Because otherwise, that determinant equals one is not preserved. So I have to preserve that. That's what I like that. So uh, that is a projective flow because I am preserving that lift. Okay. So I'm going to write the equation on the cross ratio. So the cross ratio is my invariant. I write the equation. What do I get? What I get is the Volterra model. Again, a completely interval system. And a very nice one is by Hamiltonian. I'll talk about that in a minute. And the Volterra model. So I say the tangential flow is a projective realization of the Volterra model. Because it really is the Volterra model, it's just a through in the projective group. All right. And the Volterra model is a discretization of the quarter the pre equation, which models waves, the soliton equation. So again, I have the three lines, right? I have the PDE, completely integral, nice. Volterra, discrete, integral, nice, the flow. All right. Okay. So this is all very nice, but if mathematically we don't get anything out of this, then this is all fun, which is good. Mm -hmm. I'm all for fun. And in fact, most of my life, that's the only thing I've done is to have fun. But eventually, you know, you want to, to know that you're getting something out of it. So what can we learn about 
completely into our systems if I do geometric realizations. Do I add anything to what we know about completely into the systems? Right? Okay. So I don't know how much people, I know that many of you know how to structure very well and my Hamiltonian structures and everything, but I don't know if everybody knows, so I'm gonna start with the basics. What is a Hamiltonian system? That's a Hamiltonian system. So this comes from classical mechanics. You have uh, a Hamiltonian function, which you think is the energy of the system. It depends on P and Q. Uh, Q is the uh, location of your point, P is the momentum, and you have this classical equation that says QT is the partial with respect to P, and PT is the partial minus partial with respect to P, and you uh, respect to Q, and you do this because if you differentiate H now, you get zero, right? That's the whole point. So the energy is preserved for a Hamiltonian system and is all good. A different way of looking at this equation is to write it like this. So you write it as P QT equals to the symplectic matrix, which is zero zero times the gradient, right? And it's not, and we say that this symplectic matrix define a symplectic structure. And the nice thing about just making this little change is that you can be a little more general and say P D equals P times the gradient is a Hamiltonian system when P has some properties, right? And the question is, what are the properties of P? And of course, you can just copy the properties of that matrix, right? And hope for the best. But you want to have properties that you can generalize because this becomes very general. And P doesn't have to be a matrix. And P doesn't even have to be, you know, the entries don't even have to be functions. They can be, they become operators and they become all sorts of things. As far as you have these properties, which is the one that defines whether or not something is Hamiltonian. So we say this system is Hamiltonian. If when I define this, what is called a Poisson bracket, is the gradient times p times the other gradient, right? It has a number of properties. And the properties are is q symmetric, we know that that's needed, bilinear in both sides, Leibniz rule, meaning it behaves like a derivative. So if I apply to the product like a d, it's going to split like a derivative does. And they're just reflecting that you have a gradient, right? Okay? And then the more important one, Jacobi. Jacobi is the cyclical combination of three of them is going to be zero. That's the Jacobi problem. And this is a critical, this is highly nonlinear, right? So this is uh, the critical part. All right, so this is a Hamiltonian system. A Hamiltonian system is something that looks like PT equals P gradient, where this bracket has this property. And this can be infinite dimensional. It can be, uh, you know, P can be operators on functional spaces. This can be extremely general. Um, the gradient can be variational derivatives, so gradients, right? And you get PDAs to be Hamiltonian using this definition and choosing the right P and the right gradient. Okay. Some systems, and in particular, all of the equations that I showed you before, <laughs> except for the flows, which we, have, we are not going to talk about now, all of the equations of the invariants and all of the PDEs, all of them have more than one Hamiltonian structure, have two. So we say they are bi Hamiltonian. They have two Hamiltonian structures with two Hamiltonians. And these are not random Hamiltonian structures. They are compatible, and what they mean is that when I add them, they are also happy. So, not just any of them. All right, so a system is bi Hamiltonian. It can be written in two different ways with two Hamiltonian structures, but those Hamiltonian structures are compatible. Okay? So, why are these 
system showing up now is because when you have that system, a system that is by Hamiltonian, there are methods to generate enough preserve enough energies, if you want, enough preserved quantities that the flow will preserve. And that the bracket of those would be zero. So these are commuting preserved quantities. And by Hamiltonian system has a couple of methods to produce those. So somehow finding my Hamiltonian structures become a step into finding commuting um, quantities. And, and there is a theory by Arnold and Liebel that says, if your manifold is even dimensional and you have a Poisson structure that is non-degenerate and you have half of the dimension in preserved quantities that commute, what you have is a torus, which is the level set of those preserved quantities, and the flow in the torus is a fine. It's just linear. And that's an interval system. These um, preserved quantities are called the angles, right? The, the um, coordinates that describe it as a, as an affine flow are called the action, and these are action angle variables, and that is the definition of the interval system for finite dimensions. So somehow that produces a shift from saying a system is integrable if I can find action angle variables, right? And I can integrate it, which is where the name comes from. I can find it, integrate it, and tell you what it is. And so we can quantum chips, actually. That was the original definition of integrability, but now it sort of shifts to I can find enough reserve quantities that compute. Because for finite dimensions, I know calculus the same. I can do one or the other. For infinite dimensions, though, that's not the same. And well, let me. <laughs> I have heard many people say it is the same. If you find the preserved quantities, give it to me and I'll solve it. Um, it yeah, nobody knows it is the same. So let's put it that way. Uh, nobody knows it. But then that sort of gave the idea of integrating is finding enough preserved quantities that commit. And that's reveals integrability. And what we are doing it is finding two Hamiltonian structures. Okay, I hope that makes sense. It's a long part. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a well known integrable of bi Hamiltonian continuous system, which is called the generalized QDB system which was defined by Lax in the 70s. Lax defined the Hamiltonian structure. He couldn't prove they were Hamiltonian, he just guessed. Um, and later on, Adler, Gelfand, and Dickey in the 80s proved they were Hamiltonian structure and they proved they were compatible. And, and this is, I, I have to say, the, all of these papers are fascinating to me. They are really, uh, Interesting. Okay, I'm going to tell you the definition of AGD brackets. For those who do not know about this, you can do like my kids. You can do this and then, no, 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 no. It's complicated, it's technical, and, and if you don't get it and you don't want to get it, I'm fine with it. Um, but just so that you know that there is such a thing. Right? So this flow starts by considering. But it's called scalar differential operators of that form. Okay. So these are symbols, by the way. If D is a derivative, you take you know many derivatives, so this D squared, the cube, etc. Alpha, the alphas are smooth, they are periodic functions, right? They can be parameter X. And these are just simple, and we treat them as symbols. Of course, if D applies to alpha, then you're differentiated. Right? So in that sense, we have these own tools on how they behave. If they are simple, I can actually talk about negative powers of D. And the negative powers of D is the one that apply to D gives you one. Right. That's right. Because I'm defining them as operators, right? You say, how do I define it? Well, this is how they behave. So when you expand these operators to include negative powers of D, they are called pseudo differential operators. So they have their own rules on how they are applied and how they work. 
This is my manifold, by the way. L, the space of L is my manifold. If you want, these are periodic S ones, right? So you have C infinity of S1, and you're going to have M copies of C infinity of S1. That's what you have. That's your manifold. It's just that the, the game of, or the rules of engagement are given by that being an operator. But in, in, in truth, you're just having N copies of C infinity S1. Okay, so how do I construct this? If I have a Hamiltonian, like yeah. If I have a Hamiltonian on L, right? How do I differentiate this? That's an interesting thought. So I'm gonna take H, I'm gonna add epsilon some of the operators, right? B is some operator that looks like that too. That, well, the derivative of that, so you wouldn't have the EN plus one. It's just in some direction. I'm going to differentiate this. Right? And this is going to be some inner product. So I need an inner product here. So this is integral S1. This is the residue of some pseudo differential operator. So it has negative powers. times P. That's the definition of the variation of derivative. X is the single differential operator for H. You prove that that exists and there is a formula. And how you do that is manipulation. Is, 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 these are symbols, right? So you say X is going to be powers with negative powers, right? And then I'm going to differentiate these. See what I get, and then you start saying, Oh, I start matching the coefficients, and there is a reversion, and you can go on and on and match all of them. All right. So you take this operator, which is the fraction of power of L, and again, these are what is all L1 over N plus one? This is D plus some B0 plus B1, D minus one. One, three. Something that looks like that. And how do you know what B is? Well, I take powers and I multiply, right? I multiply n plus one times, and then that gives me d n plus one. And then B0 would give, you know, you go to the next one that has n minus one terms, and that gives you B0. <laughs> you go to the next one that gives you the next, and so on, and so on. And you're going to take the r power of that. Oh, I didn't say what the residue is. Residue is coefficient of D minus one. Okay, so I take that, I take the variation of derivative um, and I write that equation. <laughs> and how Lax came up with that, you know, people that live through it say, yeah, it was very natural to me. It's like, whoa, <laughs> totally bizarre. So you take LT, and that means that DM plus one would not be there, but then you get alpha, all the alpha T's, they are with powers of D, right? And you take this stuff here, the plus just takes the positive powers of D only. You put it all together, and it turns out that you only get powers of minus one to zero. You make the coefficients equal and you get a PDE. That's the PDE. I don't think anybody has written the John and it goes to. <laughs> this is how really that's the PDE. These PDEs turn out to be uh, completely integrable by, by Hamiltonian. And KDV, which I talked to you before, is the one, two flow. Businesk uh, is the two over three. KDB is the one over two. And you get a lot of them. You get a whole factor. So the question to me is, we know these criticisms of KDB. We know these criticisms of Businesk. Yes? Someone on the Zoom has a question. Oh, what should I do? I, I, I was, am I on? Yes. yes. Uh, okay, I was wondering, does this have anything to do with the lax pair? 
Is, is this the lax pair? Or yeah, uh, is this the lax pair? This is what well, I mean. They have a lax pair. This is there is the second equation. There are two. Hundred this equation or the third third equation on this slide, I guess. Uh, this one. I can't see where you're pointing. <laughs> um, yeah, the third equation, the last one, right? Yeah, yeah. That's not quite a lax pair. That's, uh, I mean, there is a lax pair for L. Associated with L, okay, yeah. Associated with L, yes. Okay, thank you. But mm -hmm. that's the, but the, the equation I'm showing is the Hamiltonian structure, not the lax pair. Right, right. Thank okay. you. Yep. All right. So what? So we have again. We have these condensations for KDB. We have these condensations for busyness. And my question was was that I wanted to solve is I want to find these condensations for the general one, and I want to find these condensations about my Hamiltonian, and I want to prove that in the and so you know the whole thing. And this took forever because you'll see why. Uh, so I'm going to start talking about polygons again, and I'm going to do exactly what I did before. I'm going to take a lift here, right? I'm going to lift so that the um, areas are one, right? Now the areas are not areas. It's the terminal of m consecutive ones, m plus one actually because I'm like one higher. I mean, I mean RPM and consecutive ones. The question of can I actually manage to do that? Can I close, right? Now, n is not that it has to be even, is that n and n plus one have to be co branch And n plus one before was two. That's why it has to not be even. Uh, now, n and n plus one have to be co -primed. And if they are co I can do all of that. Of course, I have to say that n consecutive or n plus one consecutive lines have to be independent. Right? Always. We call that a non degenerate polygon. If, if you lose dimensions somehow, there is a degeneracy you can build. But, all right. So I'm going to make that one like I did before. Now, what are the invariants? So, one thing before I go to the invariants, one thing to understand is what is the projective group acting on these gammas, right? We want to know that because projective group sort of feels weird. What, what is that? On these leaves, when the determinant is one, the projective group acts as SLM plus one linear. So it's centrifugal. So it is SLM plus one linearly on the gammas. Okay. So that means if I have this polygon, I would these gammas, I would just take the SLM plus one element, the matrix, you know, here SL2, and I multiply each one of them by SL2, and that gives me another one. That's the projected transformation. All right. So now you are going to understand why these are the projective invariants. I'm taking determinants of gammas, right? So if I multiply by SLM plus one, it's all going to be fun. It's going to be binary because the determinant of plus one would be one, and that, and that would not change. And what you do is you take your L over there, the length, and you take the next vertex, the M plus one vertex, and you put it in the first position, second position, third position, fourth position, and so on. And you put it in a different one, and you get all of these invariants. And you show, you can prove that this determines the polygon. These are the invariants. These are my curvature conclusions. All right, and here is, so, so this is an evolution of the gammas, and I'm not gonna be able to show you how we came up with this. <laughs> there is a way to get on it. It's not that one day. This is what we did pin one, by the way, who is a cat. Pin pin one. It's a, a country with a cat. So there is a, a, a way, it's not like one way you know, we walk up and say, oh, that's the equation. No, we, there was a way why we came up with this equation uh, for gamma. This is a vector field, right? 
Yeah. So you want at each end to have that vector. That's a vector field. So that gives you an evolution of the polygon. And this equation preserves L. So you have a projected. And the theory with Jim Ping was that if that's a solution, then the ANs are going to be a discretization of the flaw or the M over M plus one. And when you get M equals one, you get this condition PDV, you get M equals two, you get this condition Bussinex, and otherwise. So this was our choice for this condition. Again, think of three layers, right? This is the, the ADV flaw, the discretization in the invariance, and then the flaw of the. Okay. And not only that, but Jinping, we managed to find two possible structures that made them by Hamiltonian. And we couldn't, for the life of us, prove they were compatible. And there was, uh, we did it theoretically, we then constructed the theory, didn't allow us to prove it, but it was a mess. We were stuck at this point. And, and I'm just going to show you the equations just to see why we were stuck. You see, these are the equations. These are the structures. Um, now is the shift. These are operators. You have the inverse of that, which is very not, it uses all of your vertices, the inverse of that. With, yeah. This is a major mess. So we were stuck for a long time. And then Anna Kalini and I started working on can we shift this to the polygons? Can we look at some structures on the polygons rather than the invariants that are going to tell us something else? Right? So structures for the polygon have to be applied to the vector fields that I was showing you of the of the. Um, polygonal flaws. So these are structures that are defined on vector fields. So you're going to consider vector fields on the polygons. We want vector fields that are invariant under the projective group, like before, right? Otherwise, we are off. Think of it this way. You have, what do I have it here? You have a vector and each vertex, right? So when you talk about a vector field on a polygon, what you have is a bunch of xn, right? A bunch of vectors, one in each vertex. And then in here, I'm going to define an operator. These are the invariants. The a's are the invariants I told you before. So this operator in the gamma is zero, actually. So this is a very nice operator. I don't want to uh, say a lot more. But I'm going to define this form. And this is the interesting form. So I've been thinking about this form a lot and I can't really get anywhere. And I would appreciate if anybody has seen this. This is the differential of a form. So if L was one, this is just the definition of the differential of a form. If L is one. But what I do is instead of the form, instead of applying to Y, I apply to L Y. And in here, instead of applying to x, I apply to x. And in here, instead of a commutator, I have x and y minus y of x. So it's a modification of the differential. Again, I can explain how we came up with that, but it really give not, it does not give any insight of why this works. Again, if L is plus one is a standard differential. And I am I'm gonna find this one form, which is to take the vector field and you find the determinant, you put it in place of gamma, essentially. Right? So you want is the coefficient of the gamma. That's what it is. Okay, and I'm gonna create two forms, two of the forms. This one is the differential of the gamma. And that can be the result of the gamma. Those two are going to give me the two structures that I was talking about before. Okay, so these are both closed. And if I have an, a function of invariance, there is a vector field, which is the Hamiltonian respect to gamma one. 
such that this is the important part for every Hamiltonian of a vector field with this property. That vector field is a Hamiltonian with respect to omega one, with respect to gamma, right? This is a gamma space, it's not A anymore. And then gamma two on the same fields as gamma one, uh, uh, as omega one, omega two on the same fields, give me the second. And these two properties allow us to prove that these are compatible if and only if d omega 2 is zero, which of course it is because omega 2 was d of theta. And, and then we proved it was you know, by Hamiltonian and integrable and the whole thing. So this was a, a surprise to us that it was so, so simple at the at the polygon level as compared to the invariant level. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop because maybe there are questions. There are many questions that you can answer, you know. Are there other versions for the other fractions? Uh, can I use other geometries, other homogeneous manifolds? What else can I do? What else can I leave to the polygons? And many questions that might not be answered. And that's it. Thank you. Are there any questions for the speaker? Maybe I can ask one to start yeah. about just what you were just talking about two minutes ago. Okay. You said this surprise that it was, it, it really looks beautiful at the sort of when you go back to the polygon. Uh, do you have any? Do you have any intuition why this might be the case? Because I, I might have expected that if you work on the invariance, this would be simpler than working with the polygon, but it's obviously that's, not the case. That's the thing, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so my gut's feeling, and this is just a gut feeling because I, I don't know how to precisely describe what I'm about to say. Um, these are complicated structures and complicated equations. The question is, can you hide the complication to allow something else to be simple? So in this case, complication is here. So those vector fields are complicated. You can actually find them. So it's not that you can find them, but they are not simple. Um, but shifted the complication to the vector fields to this map that goes from the invariance to the, to the polygon. That map has the complication, but then the structures get the same. That's my feeling of what's happening. Well, if you don't use that map, then you are adding to the structure the complication of the fields, yeah, so yeah. then it become monsters, right? Question, once you found the result on polygons, can you go back to invariance and say something about the answer the question about the invariant relationship between invariants? So um so here this okay, so yes, let me let me say something about that. So these are um forms of vectors with on the polygons, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and these brackets are on the space of the polygons. Mm -hmm. So that, that relation is already relating the invariance to the bracket. So, and that's how we could prove that these were uh, compatible with analysis with the bracket. Um, beyond that, I would actually like to know questions that I can think about, that I think can be answered by the other. I don't know if that's a question. Yeah. I also see that there is some people could post something on the chat. I don't know if these are questions or if there is any way to see that. I can do this. Ah, the speaker. Ah, ah so this is, uh, the speaker is busy. Any other questions? 
Um, so do you, do you see in the RPM case that this uh, sort of lowest level object is still like a tangential flow, but in RPM now? Right, I mean, we had the- The, the flow of the curve level. Yeah. No, it's the one I got, I gave you. So it's uh, it's a combine, an invariant combination of the lambdas, okay. but it's not a tangential one. It, it's, it involves M of them. So it's, yeah, yeah. a full dimensional, a full uh, basis for the, for the space. So increasing the dimension increases the complexity of your, where you are in the hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like there's another question from our Zoom. Okay. Uh, I was uh, wondering, maybe this is a naive question, but um, so for like KDV equations or integrable systems for waves, you have these soliton solutions that, that go through each other, interact, but otherwise leave each other intact. What is the uh, discrete analog of that in, in your work? I would love to know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I would love to know that. Uh, and, you know, it might not be something too hard to find because um, all of this construction have a geometric background. You know, it has a moving frame. It has a, uh, and there, are, there is geometric data that we use to write them and so on. And, and you can mark, and that structure exists for KDB too. And, and you can match them just to be sure that things you know, match completely one and the other. Um, so it would be interesting to know if I have that solution of KDB, you can match this through that same identification to a, a solution of the other and see how that behaves. Yeah, I would love to, I would love to do that. Mm -hmm. And if I ever can have, if I ever can have a graduate student again, I'd give it to that. Or if anybody wants to do it, please, I'm more than happy to help. Yeah. Good question, now. Thank you. Okay, so if there's no other questions, why don't we thank the speaker one more time? Everybody's under shock, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs>